so my name is Otto Kekäläinen and I'm from the Finnish team of Free Software Foundation Europe. And I'm going to tell you about a little bit of LibreOffice and Free Software advocacy and stuff that ha has happened in Finland in the recent two years and some things that we've seen during those issues and maybe something that we can learn learn of it. So these are some headlines that have been in English media in, in Europe in recent years. How many of you have read any of this? I could. Yeah, so some of you, but some this is completely new new stuff. There's quite a lot of that has had has happened, so I'm not going to tell it all. You can go to these websites, for example, of course, fsfe.org, or to some, for example, this join up website by the European Commission is quite good because they have staff who collect information and articles about this topic all around Europe. So you can read the details from there. Okay, but anyway, Helsinki, Tampere, and Turku, they are some of the biggest cities in Finland, and they've all had city council initiatives requiring the city to migrate or increase the use of free software like LibreOffice and others. Yeah, well, all of these <coughs> initiatives passed with fair majority, and it's quite quite obvious to everybody that that free software is a good thing for government. How many of you would like your own government to use more free software? Yeah, so it's quite obvious. I, I assume that most of us don't like the idea of paying tax to government who then buys proprietary licenses and ships trucks loads of money to the US or where most of the biggest software companies that sell closed source software come or Ireland or some tax haven as you some of you maybe read recently and also the idea of denying local business opportunities and, and limiting the influence the government itself can have on software is probably something that no politician wants but still, this is the situation in many places because of closed source software. So how come, how come the situation is like this now? Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit. Let's, let's start with the history <laughs> of a great case that exemplifies kind of all of the issues that are around this thing. And, and, and relates to this free software migration. So the Finnish Ministry of Justice started planning a large-scale migration to OpenOffice, later called LibreOffice, of course. And, and after careful planning, they started the rollout in 2007. And it was a it was well-made project, and it was very successful, and it's very very good case example because the project manager made his doctoral thesis about this about this project that it was published in 2010 so he's, he's called Marti Karjalainen and his thesis can be downloaded as a PDF file online and it's written in English so if you want to have in-depth knowledge on on free software migration and LibreOffice migration is specifically is a good source of information. I really recommend it. So, what can we learn from this example? First of all, migration is a really big thing and time-wise it takes a long time. For example, in this case, they started planning and preparing in 2003, and the actual rollout didn't complete until in 2010. And, 
And I expect that, of course, new migrations will be more easy because LibreOffice, for example, has, has advanced quite a lot. And there's been a lot of advancements in file formats, so escaping kind of the situation that your, all of your files are held hostage by the current vendor is supposed to be easier today. And this, this dissertation concludes. They, it was really throughout. They considered a lot of as aspects of the migration. And the conclusion is that migration is possible and it's feasible and it's in every, every way a great idea to do. And this is a particularly great academic dissertation because it's not just theory. They actually write about an event that took place and they have real data. And it's written after the migration, so they have real actual data of how this thing happened. And it's not, it's not a speculation of any kind or, or, or just theory. And the, and the conclusion was this. So for information, information solutions practice, the study shows that the transition to open source office suite is feasible in large scale context and that substantial benefits can be achieved as a result of the transition. And then of course, interestingly, one interesting question is what did it or cost? They have very good calculations about what it costed. Here's a table, table they did when they planned the whole thing and they made comparison of what the different options they had would, would cost. And here the Microsoft Office alternative would have cost 6.8 million almost. And, and the open office option, about two million. Mm. And, and in fact, when they did another evaluation in 2010 to look backwards how it went, <coughs> open office was actually slightly less expensive than what they had planned. And it, that's quite rare and exceptional if you think about government IT project that something actually is cheaper than what <coughs> was originally planned. So if you think about that in per percents, that's 70% cheaper for open office than for Microsoft office for this ministry. So they save, saved about 5 million euros of Finnish taxpayer money doing this thing. And of course, this was the migration part, which, which is the most difficult and, and costly to do. So for every year going forward now, they save more and more money. And, and not only that they save the money, but the money, they, instead of paying large amounts of money to Microsoft, they don't pay anything to Microsoft, and they only pay a small sum, and that small, or not, reasonable sum and that sum goes to Finnish companies so actually they increase the, the local economy's circulation and, and it's quite quite easy to say with this kind of evidence that any European agency or, or ministry could now if they want to slash their office to cost with 70% and, and get a lot of save a lot of money from being wasted overseas or to some tax haven or island and get that money to local businesses. And, and, and also note that in this dissertation it was concluded there was no, no major drawback in this migration. So it's not just about... So saving money was really easy because there was no major drawback. Of course, there were some, some issues, but certainly not, 
not any really big issues. And anyway, if you save a lot of money, then you can spend some of that money investing in, the, in solving the issues, for example, developing the software to do some certain features or something like that. And also there's, there's some huge benefits, for example, now when they use this office suit, all of their file, files are saved in the open document format, which is, which is ISA standardized and for surely can be opened in 20 or 50 years, which is not necessarily possible for Microsoft products. Yeah, you have a question. Did they do any development of uh, open office or pay for it in any way? Yeah, they had a support company <coughs> who they employed. That's, that's why it cost them this. There's, a, there's more breakdown in the dissertation about where these costs come from, but this is a higher level. So, for example, here's systems development. And that development was uh, put back into the Open Office project for everyone to benefit from? Or? Yeah, but also local, local stuff, which they needed. Ah. And here's also a little bit of license costs. And that was because at this, this time they could not migrate all of the desktops. Some, some needed still to have Microsoft Office so that they could exchange files with other ministries which can't, couldn't support open document at the moment. And, and actually, the 70%, you can e we can easily say that if anybody else does this, they could achieve 70%, but that can even be an underestimate because, because it turns out that during this time the amount of workstations increased, which they hadn't anticipated in the beginning, but that didn't, that didn't lead to any extra costs because they don't have any per workstation license costs. So the Microsoft Office option would have, would in reality, have been more expensive than the, than the 6.8 million they, they fought in the beginning. And also, it is important to note what you what you said that that the cost of Open Office was not was not zero. Of course, they it cost something because you need, still need to have support and. And such, but it's significantly smaller than if you get ripped off by Microsoft. Hmm. Okay, so the big question: if this is so great and we have like evidence, hmm. why doesn't everybody do it? <coughs> why? There's no. Yeah, you, I, I see you have some ideas. I'm gonna come back to them later. So, first of all, maybe there are some technical issues. I don't, I don't think so. For, for example, here they didn't have any major drawbacks, and even if somebody has some feature that they need, there it's still going to be just a few individual features, and if you want to develop them, then you get paid a few tens or a hundred thousands of euros. And it's economically completely viable because you would anyway have to pay huge license costs. So is it maybe lack of support services? No, certainly not. There are a lot of companies providing support, support services. And for example, SUSE is a, is a, kind, of a Europe, kind of a European company, although of course attachment is not European, but still they have headquarters in, in, in Germany, so for example, for German, <coughs> German authorities it should be fairly easy to have, have really high quality support services and do the migration. So it can't be because of this. And is it maybe then some political issue that lack, they, they lack, this thing lacks political support? Is there maybe some Politicians to have an agenda against this, and I don't think, as I said, I don't think any politician wants thinks it's a bad idea to send. No, I don't think any politician think it's a good idea to send money 
to Microsoft, they would probably rather have it have it as a local business who votes for them anyway. And, and in many places, for example, they have problems with translations and localizations, if, especially if it's a small language area, then Microsoft is maybe not interested in actually providing them this kind of stuff. And with LibreOffice, it's possible. So there's, there can't be any political agenda against this. And for example, there was a poll made last year in Finland during the member of during the parliament elections and the, and the question was should the government prefer open source software when procuring new software and, and this is this line is for the public the, of the public the majority thought that it's it, that yes the government should prefer open source and this is the average for all or candidates and these are the different parties and even the worst party still over half of the candidates said that the government should prefer open source so there certainly is political support so if it isn't one of these three things what is the reason that, the, that this change doesn't happen or it doesn't happen as fast as we want. I would say this is the reason. <laughs> yes, I'm not trying to be politically correct here and, and talk about some other company or something because basically there is just one company that that is in a position that it can use its market market position to keep competition out and that's Microsoft. <coughs> so it's a, it's a huge well if you look look about look about projects like like LibreOffice or Firefox or, or Linux on the desktop they are all projects that threaten Microsoft's core business and their revenues so they have every interest to do whatever they can to stop them from advancing if you think about something like open data or some social networks or something, Microsoft doesn't have any competing products with those, so it's fine for Microsoft that people promote those, those stuff and they don't try to do anything to stop it. But on this front, Microsoft is very active and they have a lot of resources to stop, to stop it from affiliating. So, personally I think that if you are up, up against a big international organization, the best way to fight it is to form your own big international organization. And that's why I'm, for example, a member of Free Software Foundation Europe. How, how many of you are supporters of FSFB? So, good. Those who are not yet, you can go to fsfb.org slash support. And once you've done that, we'll unlock the door. <laughs> it, it doesn't cost anything. It's like a, it's like a petition you give your political support to, to this idea. Okay, so you remember that I asked the question, why doesn't this happen at a large scale? Yeah, so emphasize on large scale. This does happen on a small scale all, all the time, and it's happening more and more often. For example, this join up page from the European Commission has a lot of case studies and news about progress in Europe. And here are some, some of the headlines I picked from join up. So we have here Munich and, and many cases in France and Italy and Greek and Poland and Spain and Sweden as examples. But if you look, for example, at LibreOffice website, here is no list of cases available. And unfortunately, free software projects and even free software companies don't seem to be that good at 
marketing and advocacy stuff. I hope that will change. Microsoft, on the other hand, is very good at marketing and advocacy stuff. And for example, they have a nice list themselves about these cases. So here's a, here's a document that uh, leaked from Microsoft as part of one of the monopoly cases, court cases, a court document. It's an internal document by Microsoft where they list list cases where they lost or won against Linux competitions. And this is this is almost ten years old this list, but still this is quite interesting because they only list two wins and they both are from Finland. City of Vasa and City of Lappeenranta. And then there's a lot of cases that they lost around the world, like Australia and China and India and Thailand and U.S. and and so on. That it's six pages long the list. And, and, and here's a uh, a column that list the Linux drivers and then the reasons they won or lost. Both these Finnish cases and the two of only two cases they won that's listed in this document, they both have as the reason they won is proven better TCO versus current environment and Linux. So TCO is total cost of ownership and this is they still use this argument even 10 years later and it's very effective and it's actually the cornerstone of their argumentation and, and their sales speak to their customers why they should not go to Linux but uh, uh, instead upgrade to the newest version of Windows and Microsoft products. So, and here are the and even if this is 10 years old, if you go to the Microsoft Finnish website today, you can still find these two case studies from Lappeenranta and Vasa explaining this total cost of ownership thing. And basically these two cases in Finland made it, made it that for 10 years there was no big big progress on this sector because people always refer to this as okay we, we tried this but it, but but the calculations show that it showed that it's not worth it. They actually they never did anything in practice. This is completely theoretical calculation done in advance. And, yeah. and it's quite interesting that when you think about this total cost of ownership, all places where you find Pro Microsoft stuff calculations, they are done before the migration. They are theoretical estimates of how it's going to go. And if you look at all the calculations of total cost of ownership that are saying that Linux is good, they are all done after the migration based on actual facts released by the authority themselves. And now, back today, to the current situation, this happened now also in Helsinki. So, Helsinki started a pilot and they installed open office on 21,000 of their workstations as the secondary office suit, not replacing yet Microsoft, but still having a pilot so people can try it out. And after having it there for almost a year, they came up with a report saying that migrating to LibreOffice would cost 21.5 million euros during seven years, so it's not worth it because that's supposedly 70% more expensive than using Microsoft Office. And, and this cascaded forward so that Helsinki was the first city to have this city council initiative to do this, and then Turku and Tampere, actually the Turku hasn't given any resolution yet, but this summer Tampere, the CEO of Tampere, 
replied to the initiative and he said that, okay, look at what happened in Helsinki, they made this calculation, it's not worth it, so let, let's not do it in Tampere either. Or, or, or actually it was very politically important, he said that there's no hurry in doing this in Tampere because the calculation so there's probably not any benefit available. <coughs> And when you look now at this, this calculation, or the interesting thing with Helsinki was that they didn't actually release the calculation. They just released a report, and part of the report was that they mentioned that they, we did this calculation and it shows this figure, so no point doing this migration. And then, then they say that the calculation is based on a model made by Gartner. And when I looked at these cases from Vasa and Lappalanta, they also actually don't contain any kind of calculations in the reports. They just refer that this is the end result of the calculation done with a Gartner model. And, and they kind of out, outsource the trustability of, of the co complete calculation to Gartner and says that this is an independent institution that did this calculation or, or provided the model to the calculation. <coughs> and, and in the case of Helsinki, they refused to give out the calculation or any details. And to my, no to my knowledge, not even the city board members have still had access to the actual calculation. And if you think about it, how can, it, how can a, a migration to LibreOffice cost 21 million euros? Yeah. That's completely ridiculous. So. The, the situation in Helsinki, uh, in Finland at the moment, is that we have a good political support and we had these initiatives, but all around in these cities, the, the IT department and the CIOs resist change and they don't want to execute these initiatives, even though the city council had clear majority and they passed. And, and we need a Freedom of Information Act request to get an official request to get the calculation. But then the city lawyer replied to us that since the calculation contains trade secrets from Gartner, they can't release the calculation. And, and, and we even asked that can we have just, just the variables that the city of Helsinki used for the calculation so that if we independently get the Gartner model then we can combine them and kind of confirm the calculation but the city denied even that so even even the part that they've done themselves and that, that they have control over and can and can could release they didn't want to release even that so it, it all sounds very suspicious and So you, 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 you probably notice, notice the pattern. And we've done an analysis of, of, of the stuff that we've got from Helsinki and they are available at fsfd.org if you want to read more about the details. Okay, so this Gartner report it's supposed to be this, this model they used for the calculation. And this is a, a trade secret, so Helsinki can't give it out. But in principle, anybody could go to Gartner and buy it if you have... If you have seven and a half thousand dollars, if you want to put on it. So, so I really wonder, how is it possible that we have this kind of system that these, these, these institutions do research but then the result is not public and you have to pay a large amount which is so large that probably nobody's no, no academic persons are getting this report and there's no kind of review or anything this is completely they could be made up and if, in this case what we know about this We know, we know that this report was even written only by one person. So that sounds also quite fishy to me. How, how can one person write something and then it's supposed to be kind of a reliable 
source of information that cities and public administration around the world, world base their concrete decisions on that that are that have that the results are in millions of euros. And I looked at this guy's background. Here's his profile at Gartner. And here are some of his recent publications. So what we know, at, the, at least he is probably competent <coughs> on evaluating Microsoft stuff because he has published so much about Microsoft. But, but there's no evidence that he has any kind of competence on LibreOffice or, or OpenOffice. And, and I googled around a little bit for this guy's name to find more about what kind of source of information this is. And it turns out he has been in media before doing all kinds of expert, expert opinions regarding Microsoft stuff and, and saying, for example, that Office Open is good and there's no it's stupidity to, to make open document and it's a standard. And, and here's another quote where he says that outfits have delayed Vista migrations to, this point, to the point of stupidity. And some are considering late 2008, even 2009, while others moon skipping the OS completely. So he's saying that those who don't migrate to Vista are completely idiots. And now, in the current situation, we know that lots and lots of public administrations skip the Vista altogether and they migrate directly to Windows 7, which is obviously quite a good decision. So it sounds we don't have, it, this process is not transparent, but the fact those information we have about these sources indicates that, that, that there's a strong, big possibility that these persons actually made pro Microsoft opinions without any, any, any valid proof. So, when you think about the success factors in this Ministry of, of Justice case in Finland, why did their migration succeed? This is probably the main reason why they succeed. This is an article from a Finnish newspaper magazine This is what it states. So, so the CEO of Microsoft Finland approached the highest officials in the Ministry of Justice and tried to convince them that their own IT staff have made mistakes in their calculations and it's stupid to migrate to open office and they would never save any money. And they offered to, to pay for independent independent calculations which are supposed to be better, probably Gartner calculations. <laughs> and, the, and the crucial thing was that the highest officials in the Ministry of Justice didn't accept this kind of offer from, from Microsoft and they trusted their own staff, that their own staff probably takes better care of their interests than Microsoft. <laughs> and if you compare about to Lappeenrand and Vaasa and many other places, this is the crucial thing that they did correct in the Ministry of Justice. So if you do a migration, wherever you do it, make sure that the minister or the, or the secretary of the department or the CEO of the company or whoever understands the migration. Because if, they, if it's just a technical thing, then Microsoft can approach the highest executives and, and play golf with them or something and then turn their opinion around. So, when, with these kind of argumentations about the total cost of ownership, the question arises, is Microsoft lying? No, they are not lying. They are very careful not to ever lie because they are afraid that they could get caught of lying. So, and in, also I read their internal marketing 
marketing guidelines and they have they are very strong that never never ever lie. So they leave that to other companies to do. <laughs> what what they train in their marketing materials is to tell so called selective truth. So you always tell the truth, but you don't have to tell the whole truth. You can leave leave the job of filling the gaps to other people. And this is another document that leaked from from or came public as in the horse processes, monopoly cases. This is an example of what kind of attitudes they have in, at Microsoft. <coughs> so it, it says finding a moderator is a key to setting up a staff panel. This is a, a guideline how to do advocacy and, and how to organize or, or how to participate in an event. And it says that that you should try to influence, if there's a panel, you should try to influence the panel and get there these kind of analysts, because analysts sell out, that's their business model. <laughs> but, but they are very concerned that they never look like they're selling out, so that, that, that makes them very prickly to work with. And then they also like consultants, because consultants, these guys are the best as moderators, get a well-known consultant on your side, but don't let him publish anything blatantly pro-Microsoft. Then get him to propose himself to the conference organized as moderator. And then since he's well-known, but apparently independent, he'll be accepted. And then eventually at the panel, they can come out of the closet and give pro-Microsoft opinions and that will influence people who are listening because they believe that this person is supposedly independent and actually giving their own opinion. So this is the kind of attitude that they have in their own trading materials. They also talk a lot about terms like fighting wars and refer to Sun Tzu manual about the art of, art of war and stuff like that. So they are very very good at, at this ad advocacy stuff. And they also, I also find a document like this, that about uh, instructing their country managers how to win government and education cases. <coughs> and they have this Microsoft Education and Government Incentives Program called EDGI, and it's a certain fund inside Microsoft that if the country manager has problems getting, getting uh, Microsoft products sold to the local government or education, they can turn to this global fund to get more money so that they can actually win the case. And the slogan goes, never lose. And here, here's, here's a an, an pick from that document. So example scenario. Government X is advocating open source for all government funded computers in order to keep X dollars inside the country and save taxpayers millions of dollars. They are looking at rolling out 50,000 PCs with Linux to all their schools and run store office at the time or some locally produced package and so on. And then here's what the country manager should do to tackle this convince them of higher value and total cost of ownership and convince them that it's good to pay, that it's okay that Microsoft products cost more because they are more productive. So if you use any company, you should always use Microsoft products because if you use any other product, your employees just are, are going to waste their time. And there's This is obviously, there's no, no evidence for this kind of argumentation, but, but they can do this, and they can, for example, also do this kind of, con kind of a donation, so that if you use $1 million to buy Microsoft stuff, they can, for example, <coughs> donate you a half a million, which sounds cool, but still you lost a half a million when you bought from Microsoft. So. 
It's not good. Here's, here's more, more stuff about the NG fund, but let's skip that for, for now. And, and here, see a simplified version, a nice, nice diagram from their document explaining the process. So make, make the Linux, Linux option scary, and then sell the Microsoft solution, and work this give list of arguments why you should use Microsoft. And then if that doesn't work, you can go to the regional response team or maybe to the regional director in the US. And, and always never lose and escalate. So if you're, if you're a country manager and you're losing, then you can, should escalate upwards in the organization so that more competent people can take over the case and never lose. Also, this FUD is important. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And if you look up FUD in the dictionary or, for example, in Wikipedia, you will find Microsoft. They didn't invent the term, but they are extremely proficient in using it for their advantage. And this total cost of ownership and FUD concepts, they are old. They've been using it for at least 10 years, but they are very effective and they still continue using it. So if you, if you want to work for Linux and, and promote free software, you need to understand these total cost of ownership and FUD concepts, how they use it, and what's the arguments. And here's an example from a, from a Finnish newspaper. The, the newspaper, a few weeks earlier, they covered covered a story from, from a school in Lappeenranta which made significant savings like 70 or 80 percent when they migrated to Linux. And then, then the CIO, no not the CIO, the, the public relation guy from Microsoft then wrote to the, to the newspaper and his article or his opinion got published on the opinion page and this is a very typical argumentation from Microsoft side that they, they agree, yes, Linux is cheaper, but remember the total cost of ownership that if you use Microsoft you will be more productive and you will if you use Linux you will use lose your employee work time. And also also they refer to this that from from the IT budget the license costs are only for, from Microsoft sources, 7.5%, I think maybe 15% goes on average to license cost in an IT budget. So that's supposed to make it, it doesn't matter, it's just 7%, it's just a small sum, so don't try to set, do any savings in license costs. And then they refer to this, this total cost of ownership and, and labor costs. And then they make these complete FUD, FUD statements that Microsoft has 24-7 support and there's nobody giving support to OpenOffice, which is obviously not true. And then out of the hundreds and thousands of migration cases, they pick a few cases that have failed and they bring these as examples without telling the whole truth. So they let everybody else to fill that gap. So this is an example of the selective truth mm. technique. And, and also, this, this argument is quite important that they say that the license costs are only 7% or I think maybe 15%, but they don't tell the whole truth and they don't explain how lock-in works. Because lock-in works that even if you pay only this amount in license costs, since you have these certain programs, you are in lock-in and every, every time you renew your licenses, you are forced to buy them from the same so the license costs go up every year all the time and also if you want to buy any additions or some development or custom stuff or <coughs> consulting you are also bound in certain ways to the original source depending on the degree of lock-in for example in the case of Helsinki they, I don't know maybe they pay 15% in license costs 
but they are, that, 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 that's not the only sum they have <coughs> paid to Helsinki, to Microsoft. So here's an example that in the case of Helsinki, they are also forced to do certain things. They are forced to buy this premium, premier support service from Microsoft. And this year they bought this. It's a three-year contract. three-year contract and they buy less than a thousand by about one one man a year for each year and they pay for the entire time they pay 205 euros per hour so basically for yeah, I'm sorry this is this is equals about one one year of work for one person so they pay 400,000 for for that one person to support them. So this is obviously overpriced. Mm. So you have this 7% or 15% for your license cost, and then you have these all kinds of overpriced additional costs and services and stuff that you can't escape because you have locked in. And that's the reason when you migrate to Linux, in many phases, the cost savings are huge, like 80% or 70%, because you get rid of the licenses, and then all of the rest of the costs you have for hardware and support and everything, they also go down because it's a more competitive environment, you have more options and you can choose cheaper stuff. So, what to do about this? Now my proposal is that we should start, those who do advocacy and marketing, we should concentrate on TFC, standing for Trust, facts, and confidence to overcome this FUD because FUD is still relevant and we need to fight FUD <laughs> using these three methods. And, and trust, trust is difficult, but the first step is to make people get, get to know these uh, alternatives and it's very important that they get some first-hand experience with the, with the products. For example, I know that in many places, if the CEO has installed Ubuntu in their own home, then the company is much more likely to migrate and stuff like this. Or, and, and I know for some, some, some municipalities, uh, uh, one municipality where the CIO thought that if you want to migrate to LibreOffice, you have to install Linux on every computer because they didn't understand. They had never tried LibreOffice. So the first step in building trust is to make them experience and spend time with the with the alternative. And this I've been doing in Finland. <coughs> I've had a lightning talk about this in FSCons in, in previous years. So I have I, this is one thing we do in Finland. We have this project called Valocd. So it's a free software in a box, and then we give this out, and this includes, among others, LibreOffice, so that it is as easy as possible for people to, to get acquainted with the alternatives. And here are, are some of the English version, if you want to have one and take it with you. Maybe to give your city CIO or somebody. Do you send it out, or how do you distribute it, or Wait, do you well, let other people do it? Uh, you can uh, you can order it from the website, or you can also download it if you want to burn the ISO, ISO file yourself. Or then, of course, when we do advocacy, we take the CD and oh. give it to the correct person. And es especially when you think about that the CIOs are often like in their 50s or something, older people, and they are not they don't trust downloading stuff off the internet because internet is scary, and they are. They are used to going to a shop and buy and paying like 500 euros for a box that has Microsoft Office in it. So they want, they believe that proper software comes in a box, and this is a box that qualifies. <laughs> and another thing with this trust is that it needs time. So when they get their first hand experience and they know that, okay, this is. I can use this program and this is not difficult and this actually works. That is on the first level of trust and then it takes time to get on the second level of trust 
because then you have to experience all the updates and how the community works and the, re the releases and maybe you may file a bug report and you get some it gets resolved and stuff like that that takes time 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 to develop and, and from for our point of view as time goes along people are automatically more and more inclined to use free software because Microsoft is is often quite <coughs> Uh, they are afraid of losing their position and they are quite aggressive in sometimes and sometimes their aggressive, aggressive, aggressiveness is too much and they scare their own customers. For example, when this initiative in Helsinki was made and the main author of it, uh, Johanna Sumuvuori, who is in the city council and also the city board and at the time was also a member of the parliament, then the Microsoft PR guy uh, sent her email and, re and required that they must meet quickly and then she didn't have time in, the, in her schedule but she made time because the style was aggressive and then the Microsoft guy came to the parliament and he had a copy of the initiative where every paragraph had comments from Microsoft trying to overthrow the arguments in the initiative and it was very aggressive style so as long as this stuff happens that's also played in our 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 court and, and the facts part that should be relatively easy you just have to make good websites that presents the facts for example in the LibreOffice case, the LibreOffice website should have a list of this. Some example cases of people who have, or organizations who have migrated. And they should have references to dissertations like the one I presented. And if possible, they should also have some competing calculation models to the Gartner one. And, and preferably some, some easy web form which you can open and fill in the data and click calculate and it will show you that this much it will cost and everything all source code and all all, all, all models public and, and available for public security and then the confidence part that is the most difficult thing to do because because to make to gain confidence you need to have a personal connection so so you actually have to go and meet those people so that they learn learn who you are and trust you and, and, and think that the community that you represent is is good and for example in Finland it's a little bit sad that there are no active LibreOffice salespersons to my knowledge no LibreOffice salesman ever approached any of the city CIOs where the initiative was. And we also have one tool that Microsoft does not have, we can vote. So next time you have elections in your country, check out what your candidate's opinion is. And you might also be interested in this campaign by Free Software Foundation Europe called Ask Your Candidates, where this views are documented in a wiki. <coughs> One question there. Ah. Uh, just a, ah, just a minute. Yes, sorry. I, I'm, I, I'm sure you all have a lot of opinions and discussions, so we'll yeah. take that when I'm ready. So, so when I read this internal Microsoft documents that have come out in the court cases, I noticed one thing that they are particularly afraid of, and that's critical mass. So this never lose slogan is because if, if there is any good migration cases, it might spread like a disease, and they are very afraid of that. And if you think about, for example, the success of Apple, it was maybe 10% or 8% or the critical mass that, that Apple gained, and after that, everybody who does any software has to have started to consider do they, does their work, software work in Mac and so forth. So I don't know what the critical mass is for 
Linux desktops or LibreOffice or whatever, but we might be quite close and all we have to do is continue pushing so that we maybe get a 5% or 8% or 10% market share. And then if that is the tipping point, after that we don't have to do anything anymore because the dynamics will, will do it for, it, for, for us. And if you want to, so FSFP is, as I said, if you want to fight a large multinational company, the, the, the first thing to do is to join a large multinational organization that has the capacity and, and resources to do that. So please sign up as supporters for the FSFP if you want to support our activities. Thanks. Now to that discussion. So you, you had something and you had oh, we can take it afterwards. Um, so re regarding the analyst thing and getting people onto panels, uh, the, a friend of mine from Chile uh, tells an interesting story where he's a he's a diplomat, he's in his sixties now and he used to be at World Intellectual Property Organization, now he started this free software organization in Chile. And they were putting together a big conference. And then, then apparently Microsoft was one of the sponsors. And so he asked them, would you like to send a person to this panel? And they didn't get back to him really. And after a while, he mailed them or called them again and said, can you send a person to this panel? No, um, yeah, OK, we'll give you contact. And um, then someone showed up and introduced himself as being from an entirely different organization, some sort of non-governmental thing. And, um, my friend introduced him as, well, this is Mr. So-and-so from Microsoft. And the guy protested, no, 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 I have nothing to do with Microsoft. I'm from this other organization. And my friend said, well, I don't know about this. All I know is that I asked Microsoft to send someone and you came. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of worth looking into, yeah, who people might be working for. Um, because they do this rather routinely, they do it everywhere. So, how many of you know somebody who uses Windows? Hands up. <laughs> come, and, come and take one with you for the souvenir. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thanks for your time. The lightning sessions are coming now, so we need to 